So uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the project with the uh, coasters. And um, first thing is um, you're going to be dealing with two different types of fabric. Uh, one that we're going to cut the pinwheel out of. That's the first part of this. And then the second is when we cut the, uh, the base, in essence, forming that hexagon coaster shape that we learned about in the lesson. So for the... Um, for the um, pinwheel type of applique that we're going to use, you could certainly back it with something like uh, this uh, cutaway OESD product. Uh, it's called Applique Fuse and Fix. That's certainly a possibility. This is you know, just what it looks like when you fuse it to the back. There's going to be like a release paper that you can peel away. Um, another product that you could use in addition to this Applique Fuse and Fix would be something like um, this steam it seemed too light. Same type of deal. You've got like a um, a release paper here that you peel away. You iron it onto the wrong side of the fabric. You cut your shape and then you peel away the other paper which gives you the adhesive to apply to the base fabric. So those are a couple of products that you could use. When you're cutting the pinwheel shape, um, I have here the large oval hoop. And in the large oval hoop for the cutting of the pinwheel, I have just a tear away because I don't want that stabilizer to live on the project. You could certainly cut each pinwheel separately. So you could put one piece of fabric down there, cut the shape, re-hoop with the stabilizer. When that is done, you put the next fabric, et cetera, et cetera. What I would prefer to do, because the cut work tool can do this, is I'm going to take these four colors of fabric, align them up in the hoop, and cut everything at once. Again, each time I cut uh, the pinwheel out, I will still have this, um, this fusible, which I can apply to the base fabric. So first thing we're going to do is let's go over to the machine and I'm going to show you how you can line things up, use the cut work tool, a basting box that's built into your machine, etc. Fun is to be had, so stay tuned. So you're looking at the screen of my machine and in order to set this up, I want to first tell the machine that I actually have foot 26 on. So I'm tapping here, going into the screen here. It always generally will tell me the recommended foot in the upper left hand column. The icon is larger than this. Others and it also has a gold star which means recommended feet. By the way there's an icon up here which tells us that if we wanted to choose this this will show other feet that you could potentially use for the same design. And so things like that's the uh, yarn um, felting um, foot I should say. Uh, yes and there's uh, up here like this is a yarn couching foot this is the foot number 44C that we use for um, echo quilting as well as for um, uh, doing cut work, which we'll use in a bit. The paintwork tool, a darning foot, again, foot 26, which we have on. Uh, this is a um, quarter inch um, ruler foot. Love that. Classes to be had on that, absolute. And then this foot here is used for uh, doing rhinestones, cutting templates. So you could potentially use all of those feet for the same design. Uh, not for the cut work part, but for this, uh, because the first thing we're doing is the uh, tack down stitches, just the outline stitches that we created, not the cut work. So I'm going to tap here. If you notice, once I've done this, the red warning sign goes away. I have the large oval hoop on because that's what it called for. The other thing I would highly recommend, let me just turn this part here off. Uh, let's see, and we're going to say foot 26, foot 26, yes. Um, the other thing I would highly recommend is I have the straight stitch plate on the foot on the machine. Actually, I'm going to take this off and let you see. Down here, let me kind of zoom in here close. Do you see this, this plate here? I keep saying the straight stitch plate. It absolutely is a straight stitch plate. But do you notice here how there's no markings like you see on the quarter inch or the uh, excuse me, the 5.5 or the 9 millimeter plate. This is just a smooth plate. Um, this is actually a cut work plate. Uh, you see how it has like a red marker here, which is kind of like a warning sign type of thing. Notice this plate. This plate here, this has an orange decal on it. This is also a straight stitched plate, but also let me see if I can get that glare out. There's lines here that we would expect to see like on the other plates, like the 5.5 millimeter. Let me grab this because it's handy enough. 
like this is the 5.5 millimeter. Do you see how there's markings on this? Do you see how there's like a red decal here? Very similar to what's on here, you know, but there's no markings on this. And of course your 9 millimeter plate, which is um, this guy here, and again, we do have we do have markings like you would imagine. Uh, that's the nine millimeters. Um, there's no like red or orange splotch here. So I'm going to back up just a little bit here, backing up, and you can see uh, on my bed of the machine right now, I've got four different stitch plates that you could potentially put on the machine. This is the cut work plate, red decal, no um, measurement marking. This is the straight stitch plate, orange decal stitch markings, you know, in millimeters uh, and in imperial, uh, absolutely like 3 eighths, 5 eighths, etc. This is the 5.5 millimeter plate, 5.5 um, millimeter opening with the marks, and then again a 9 millimeter plate with the markings, you know, for aligning your 5 eighths of an inch seam, etc., like you would expect to see on most sewing machines. So our Bernina machines in embroidery mode, like we just saw, can use a lot of different feet, and in our sewing and embroidery, we can use a lot of different plates. Big difference is with our uh, presser feet, when we put presser feet on, there are oftentimes sensors, eyes on them, that tell the machine generally what the classification of the machine is. So it knows if you have something on that shouldn't be there, um, maybe for a different application. But on, uh, when it comes to stitch plates, we do want to tell the machine that I have this particular plate on. So if I come back to the machine, like say the following day, or I'm doing another part of the project where I'm actually um, sewing a seam with a zigzag that I don't accidentally break the needle. So let me take you back up to the screen. And so here we are back here. I think you can see all of that. So the thing I want to make sure I do is I'm going to touch the plate and I'm going to tell the machine that what I have on here is actually the cut work plate, which is this guy right here. Notice also, just as an aside, this is where you can tell the machine not only whether or not you have a straight stitch, but you could also tell it, excuse me, a single needle versus a twin needle of various separations, you know, from 1.0 to 8.0 separation. Um, this is where you have your, your needle minder, where if I go into here, I can tell the machine that, yes, I have an embroidery needle on, which I do, and it's a 90, which I do. Um, that's also very useful. Um, I'll sometimes just keep the pack of needles that I'm currently using on the machine by the machine as a gentle reminder as well. Um, and so that's, you know, again, how to set up the machine correctly, I think, is really important. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just putting the hoop on the machine. You don't need to see me do that. But what you do want to see me do is how to put a basting box around this design. Now, why would I want to put a basting box around it? It's because I'm not going to be hooping the fabric in here. I'm going to act, you certainly could, but I'm going to use multiple layers and I want them all stitched down and I want to know where to place the fabric, which is considerably smaller than the hoop in the field. So the best way to do that is stitch a basting box uh, first onto the stabilizer. So let me go ahead and show you how that's done. This is where I edit designs here. If I come into the embroidery mode, which is down here, I'm just going to tap here. This takes me to the embroidery mode, and it's this icon here. You see there's a yellow box. This is my basting box here, and you can even see here down below where it says the first thing is a basting marker, which is exactly what I want to do. So just coming down here, just so that you can see, because it's not fun to look at that screen when I'm stitching, I'm just going to go ahead and push the start button. And then we will do that. So I was going to edit all of that out. You could see that the um, bobbin thread was not picked up by the needle, which happens oftentimes in basting because, again, you're asking the machine to right off the get-go take a long stitch and not a tie-in, which we normally have in embroidery. We normally do like a tie-in, a couple of little stitches in a small space, and then we start to take off from there. In basting, you're taking a stitch and then you're kind of going for it. Um, so what I wanted to show you is how I fix this. I went back into the bobbin, I pulled the length of thread that I needed in the bobbin, I came here and I told the machine go back to the first stitch, which it did, and so you can see here that it's showing this is the first stitch, and then 
what's going to happen is it's going to take off. I think it went this way. It went north. By the way, when you digitize designs, if you're doing a basting box, which is how I oftentimes prefer to do these things, because I will have control over where that basting stitch starts, and I generally do not start and end basting things in a corner. I usually start somewhere up here. It just tends to work a little bit better. So I'm going to go ahead and come back down to the machine. So we're back where we were. I have hold of my upper thread here. And then what I want to do is I'm just going to go ahead and hit the, um, the needle down button. And it, what it did is it just took one stitch for me. The needle down, uh, you know, up down button, it takes one stitch. Now do you see here how, how I have a bobbin thread pulled up here? I'm going to go ahead and pull that a little bit more. So now what happens is I have not only the top thread but the bobbin thread in my hand it is secure in my hand absolutely so I have a little more control over this this is similar to if you're ever doing uh, machine quilting per se uh, or just quilting quilting you generally bring up your bobbin thread so the same thing long story short so that that doesn't happen to you which it did to me and the bobbin thread is lost just go ahead and bring up the bobbin thread and then go ahead and push your start button and then it will go ahead and start doing the basting and you can see it's a little more successful that way. Now what it did is it went ahead and did exactly what it needed to do. It, um, it cut the thread uh, and then it went ahead and came to the first stitch of the design. What I want to do, um, you can kind of see, let me go back up. See? So what I want to do is I want to go back a color. So to do that in our machines, we simply uh, hit the uh, back up arrow. And you see how I'm back to where the basting thing is? Yeah. So what I'm able to do now, let me go back down into here. What I'm able to do now is I'm going to take my my fabrics, these guys here, and I'm going to kind of get them superimposed on one another. I'm not going to show you this on camera. That's just too much entertainment. All right, so I have I have these pretty much lined up in a stack, and I'm going to put the stack over the top where that basting box is. Okay. So again, it's just kind of showing me where where I need to line all this, uh, place all these fabrics in the hoop. So I'm going to do the same thing. In fact, I'm going to move this off to the side for just a bit. And I'm going to do the same thing where I touch just the needle up down button because I want to bring up that bobbin thread again. And there is the bobbin thread. And so now I've got both those guys in my hands again. I'm now going to take these puppies. That's the technical name for these. And I'm going to line those up to the edge of that basting box. And then up here, I want to make sure this is up here. Now, just because I don't want to sew my fingers on camera because you don't want to hear um, uh, any things that we don't want to be said, I'm going to take this speed control. I'm going to slow this thing down because what I need to do now, I can't like, I really can't take 505 and spray all this. It's too much adhesive for this. And remember, I've got that, um, that backing, uh, uh, fabric or backing layer with the fuse and fix on it. So I've got both threads in my hand. I have kind of a hold on this when it gets started. I'm going to gently hold that in position and let this draw the basting box or stitch it out, I should say. So let me go ahead and start. I'm holding it here. Isn't that nice? It's nice and slow. I'm not panicked. I'm not sewing over my finger. That has happened in class when I've had students do that. That's like really sad. It's happened to me. Never. I've never stitched through my finger. I hope you guys never have. That's, I know several people that have, but they continue to sew because they are true troopers. And I'm just kind of keeping things lined up, keeping my hands out of the way. But what's happening is this is just stabilizing all of those layers in the hoop. So 
I will hopefully have a relatively successful stitch out. Okay, so it went back to the first part of the design, which is just fine. I will say that our machines cut the threads uh, kind of on the short side, which is okay. But I'm going to do the same thing. I wish it had a little more length, in other words. I'm going to go ahead and just push the needle up, down a button again, and just see if I can grab that bobbin thread. Oh, there it is. Life is good, folks. Life is good. And so I'm going to take these guys, and again, I'm just holding them out of the way. You generally, again, you generally are not doing this in regular embroidery, but this is Abby normal embroidery. That's why we, we call this Design Works, because <laughs> anything goes. And so I'm going to just cut these threads out of the way. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to push the Start button. I don't need to go this slow for this, but I'm going to first start it, let it go slow. I'm going to then... Um, I'm going to then um, speed it up a bit. So let's just go ahead and tell it to start. And it's stitching. I'm cutting, getting my hands out of the field. Then coming up here, I'm going to speed this up a bit. And so what you're seeing it doing is it's just doing the stabilization stitching that we put in. This was like the red arcs that were in our design. And then do you remember how we copied and pasted it? And then we turned that pasted copy into cut work. And that's gonna go just to the inside of these lines that are just stitching now. So all of these lines that are being stitched are there for stabilization. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is, you might be inclined, let me come back up here, you might be inclined to go ahead and do the cut, cut one. What I would recommend, and I think Debbie recommended too, is in Design Works, we don't have as much control over the sequence of events as we do in, um, in regular Bernina V9, V8 software. So what I would like to do is, I'm going to bypass this cut one, cut two, cut three, cut four. And I'm going back, see up here, there's like a stabilization line. It's a sewn line. I want to go ahead and sew that. So I'm sewing down all of my stabilization first. And then lastly, I will go ahead and do all of my cutting. So let me come back down here. Like such. I'm not going to, uh, no, I am going to bring up my bobbin thread because I can. Uh, so I'm just going to, again, push that needle up, down button. I'm going to gingerly pull this through. There's my little bobbin thread. Come here, my little darling. You go out of the way. You come to me. Now, this might very well have just stitched out fine, but what I don't want to have happen is just like what happened in the basting. So I just pull it up. Uh, it doesn't take, you can see it, it didn't take that long. And so I'm going to go ahead and just let this thing stitch. And then I can go ahead and speed this up. Okay, so I have all of my all of my um, st stabilization runs done. 
Do you notice what's happening next? It's asking for cut one blade because what it's going to do is it's going to cut the, the outer perimeter, the outer perimeter here of this design. I don't want to do this now because then it would fall out of the hoop and that would be sad. So what I want to do is I'm going to actually go back in the design. Whoops, back in the design. I was going forward. So see, I'm back at cut one, and now it's going to start cutting out these spokes. Now I'm going to go off camera now because I need to switch over the uh, to the cut work tool, and you do not need to see me do that. One moment. So I have the cut work tool on, and again, we're in a part of the design that's asking for a cut. Notice up here, foot 26 now has this red caution flag because it doesn't want us to use cut uh, excuse me, foot 26 with this. So I'm going to go ahead and click here. This again brings us, try that again, bring us up to the um, page with the feet. Again, upper left hand corner, 44C is the foot that it is suggesting. That is what we have on it. I'm going to go ahead and click there. I'm going to go out of the screen. I still have the cut work plate on. I haven't changed that. So with this on, I'm coming back down to the cut work tool. And I wanted to point out once again, I have the number one in the window. Do not assume that you're always at number one. You always want to look at the screen of the machine to ask what blade it's calling for. And do not assume that when you put your tool in, that you're in position number one. It is, has happened that the person sets everything up correctly, but they uh, left the, oftentimes what will happen when you put this tool away, you're going to be in position four. You simply then put the tool back in. It's a new design. It's a new day. And it says cut one. And you put the tool on and you push start. And you're not getting successful cuts because the blade is not in the correct orientation. So bottom line is you always want to double check what number is this on and what number is the machine calling for. And so I'm going to go ahead and um, do these cuts. Um, what I will tell you, I'm not going to... I'm not going to have you guys watch this. I mean, I'll, I'll get this to start and you can like see it going. I'll continue to talk. But, um, so it's going to jump around and you've seen this. It's going to, it's going to eventually ask you to go through all four blades. What will happen is because we went back in the design, it will eventually ask us to put back in thread and it's going to want to stitch this outer border again. Remember? So you want to skip back that, skip over that because we've already done this. And then what will happen at the last part of the design, it will cut all four positions for this little octagon. And that's where I will bring you guys back uh, with me. So what you have here for your viewing pleasure are the four cut out little pinwheel shapes. Again, all cut out at once. Um, you can't really do that on like a um, silhouette or a cre cut, etc. So multiple layers can be cut, um, and I'm loving that about the um, about this program and the software. What I have hooped here uh, is two layers of um, kind of a heavy cutaway because I want this to stay in the project. What was up in here? is was just a tear away in the stabilizer once again the backing fabric here you're gonna uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do this on camera but I'm gonna score it here peel this away there's fusible I'm gonna fuse it when the time comes and you'll see what I mean um, the other thing I would want to point out is in addition to or in lieu of two layers say of cutaway heavy cutaway you could use like a Pellon like a Timtex type of thing this is the stuff that they use like in I don't know, uh, visors on caps and those types of things. It's kind of a stiff thing. We use this like in bag making a lot. It's uh, it's relatively thicker, and you could certainly hoop that and uh, party with that as as well. That would just give the the um, coaster a little more body. Um, speaking of the coasters, um, this is my base fabric that I'm using for the coaster. That'll go in the hoop. Uh, and I'll use a little bit of um, 
505 spray. By the way, if I didn't mention on this uh, two layers of uh, stabilizer here, I also used um, 505 spray because I wanted these two layers to be adhered or moving as one, if you will, because we're going to be doing a lot of decorative stitches here. And the last thing you want is for this to be doing a little micro separation in the hoop. That's where you're going to start getting your um, thread breaks and skipped stitches and those types of things. But what will happen, and we'll do this on the machine, is I'm going to, um, once again, uh, stitch out the um, the outline so I know where well I don't really need to do it do I because this is this fills the whole hoop right so I can I can bypass that step so X day on that but what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this on the top of the hoop and then I'm going to do some 505 on the back of this hoop let me see if I can back out just a bit more yeah uh, on the back of the hoop and then I'm going to slop that on the back uh, and so that way the back of the coaster will also look um, nice as the uh, top. If you didn't do that, it's the, the world is not over. You'll just have kind of a white backing um, with the stabilizer. But I, I would recommend do what I suggest as far as put a backing on that. I don't know if that was mentioned in Debbie's uh, presentation, but that's how I would do it. So um, let's go over to the machine and I'll show you what the next step is. So we're back with the machine. I brought up the uh, stitch file that has now all the decorative stitches. The only cutting that will be done on this is at the very end where it cuts out the perimeter of the uh, hexagon after the satin border has been stitched and of course the um, stabilizing stitch outside of that. I do want to make sure that I, um, I tell the machine that I'm putting foot 26 um, C on the um, on this because I am actually using a um, embroidery foot now and so um, because it's stitching right and so there we go now that being said do you see how it looks like I have more room in the hoop and I do because I have foot 26 on when we come to the cut work part of it we're going to need to tell the machine that once again we have foot 44 C on so it's important when you're designing this in the software to make sure that you have the correct hoop that you are using uh, so that you are not uh, unfortunately coming to your machine and it's not working out like you had envisioned. In other words, if you're designing the cut work and you're telling the machine you're using 26, the foot 26, you could certainly design cut work that's outside of the embroidery field because 44C is larger than 26. And we have discussed this in the past. So I'm just going to thread my machine here. I've actually used a um, a kind of an orange contrasting type of thread. And let's just see if we're going to get that rolling there. Let me see here. And I'm going to say yes. Go ahead and do. Okay. And so that is all threaded up here. And then I'll go ahead and get this to start. And then I'll go ahead and tell it to start in the embroidery. You'll see this is the outline stitch. I'm just going to do the outline stitch. And then um, when we come back to this, I will, um, well, I'll explain it as, as I go. So let me just start this, this outline stitch. I'm kind of using a higher contrast thread because I want the decorative stitches to uh, stand out and all this is doing now is it's making the bottom fabric that I 505 and the top fabric be adhered to the stabilizer and it's also showing me where I need to fuse the pin, uh, pin tuck that we just did. So um, I will go off camera now and we will come back when I've got the pin tuck thing in place. So here you see, um, you can kind of see the trace of the guidelines here that just shows you how to line the, um, I keep saying pin tuck, but it's the pin wheel, uh, into place on the uh, coaster. I fused it with an iron. Uh, we're going into uh, color number two, which is going to be all the decorative stitching that will um, adhere this down. Again, it's already adhered with the fuse and fix, but um, again, this is just a decorative finish. So I have hold of the thread tail. I'm going to go ahead and push the start button and as 
you can see, it's beginning to uh, stitch everything down, and we'll uh, let this guy run. Uh, I will tell you as far as the sequence, I, I'm sure that it was better in um, in Debbie's video. This it's stitching the um, the center of it first. That I do believe because it was a separate color. Just make sure that you're moving that to last, uh, not last, but uh, after these rays are stitched. It's not going to make that much of a difference, but I think it would just be a better finish if that stitched after the rays stitch. So let me go ahead and let this finish stitching, and then I'll take you back. So as you can see, it finished stitching out the um, tack downs for the applique piece, which is fine, and. Again, I'm not, I'm not hating on uh, the change in the order. I mean, you can, you can kind of see. Let me see if that'll focus. Let's see. Come focus, focus. Yeah. I mean, it looks fine. It looks fine. But again, I, I would recommend stitching this last, this, the circle part. But again, it looks fine. So I'm gonna come back out and just kind of show you what's next. Choop, choop. So. The next part of this design is going to be um, stitching the satin stitch border around it. You don't need to see me stitch a satin stitch. You've done it a million times. <clears throat> It'll finish this, and then the last thing it will do, and I, I can just show you, the last thing it will do moving forward in the design is it's going to ask me to do a change of color of thread. I'm not. It's the same color. It's just going to do a stabilization line around the design, and then we get into our cut work. I change over to the cut work tool. I have the foot 44C on. I boogie in all four positions, if that's what it calls for, and then this design, two, three, and four. That's the design complete. You can see I can't go any further forward in the design, but that is complete. And then this thing is going to pop up, pop out of the um, hoop, which is always a miracle. And I'll come back on camera and just show you the uh, coaster once everything's complete. So here you can see the uh, coaster's complete. Again, the um, used contrasting fabric is the same base fabric on both sides. So you'll see. You have this base fabric here, and if I turn this one over, that's how the back side looks. I was very impressed as to um, the satin stitch, which was a decorative satin. Let me go ahead and zoom in on this so you can see a little closer. It was really a very pretty um, satin stitch on the end here, and I was also very impressed with how the cut work tool cut very close but didn't cut into the stitching here. So if you're doing this and you happen to nick some of the satin stitch, you can always use like some fray check. Um, and sometimes when I am doing cut work, I might apply a little bit of fray check to the edge before I do the cutting, um, just as a safeguard. But again, it's um, I generally find that the tool does a pretty good job in, um, in digitizing. I am going to point out that um, this was the initial one that I did. Let me get in close here. And, and it came out it came out fine. It came out fine. Um, a couple of things that I would rather have had different. Let me just zoom out just a little bit. Do, do, do. Um, a couple of things, um, as I'd mentioned earlier, I would have liked to have this stitched last after this had stitched. Again, before before the outer satin stitched, um, but um, after the um, after the razor stitched. And what I did is in the software, I went back in and corrected that. I made the ring stitch last. I'm going to also zoom in once again. This this caught the fabric just fine. But I was um, thinking to myself that I would like this to have been a little more um, pronounced, shall we say. So um, let me just look at this guy here. So what I did is I corrected, correct, or I sh shouldn't say corrected, I changed a couple of things. The first one stitched out just fine. But I just made the stitching itself a little bit wider um, than it was initially. And so if you looked at, say, oh... Like even even like with this one here, let me get it back into its original position. Okay, so yes. So you can see like here I actually even changed I changed the outline stitch from this to this. So that's another thing that you could do 
if you so chose. Um, with many times when you're designing things, when you're stitching things out, let me just zoom back out again. When when you're when you're designing things, you're always going to do like a test stitch out, and then you can always go back in and tweak the di designs. It's important that you remember to save any of the things you design in Design Works as a draw file, D R A W, because that is the original editing file. If you export it to um, the machine, it's going to save it as an EXP Plus file. And you can certainly bring that back into Design Works, but an EXP Plus file will only be seen as a stitch file. It will not be seen as a, um, as a Design Works file. So for me to change properties with a lot of the stitches and mirroring them, etc., those options are lost once I no longer have a draw file. So take home here is uh, always save it as a draw file and you're going to export as an EXP plus to the machine. I thought the project was very, very good. Christmas is just around the corner. And you know what they say, even if this video was shot on December 26, Christmas is always just around the corner. So I think this would make a very nice Christmas gift or a housewarming gift or what have you. It was a great, pic uh, great project by uh, Debbie Lashbrook, and I appreciate her genius as always. So I hope, um, hope you guys enjoyed this as well, and we'll see you guys in the next Design Works class.